years after one of the biggest cruise disasters in recent history, some locals will be sad to see the wreck of Costa Concordia go. In this week's travel show, we find out why. We're in Italy to ask why one of the world's most famous wrecks has become a tourist attraction in its own right. People did die on it, but as I said, I like seeing it and I like being here. Global Guide is dancing in Switzerland and wing walking in the UK. We head to London to meet the woman running tours that trace the history of the capital's public conveniences. Victorian toilets tend to have names. This one is the Venerable. And I get a chance to practice my gardening skills at a rather special location. Hello and welcome to The Travel Show with me, Adia Depitan. This week coming to you from Rome, where earlier this year, the stunning gardens of the Pope's Castel Gandolfo residence were open to the public for the very first time. later on in the program I'm going to be putting my green fingers to the test as I get an exclusive behind the scenes look at what it takes to keep the gardens in such immaculate shape. But first... In just a few weeks time the wreck of the Costa Concordia is scheduled to be towed away for scrapping and recycling. We sent Rajan to the island of Giglio to see the wreck for himself and find out what it has done to tourism. Just off the coast of Tuscany, ahead of me, is the island of Giglio, until recently a secluded idyllic spot for holidaymakers in the know. Perhaps the most dramatic thing to have happened here was marauding Saracens coming over in the Middle Ages. But then, in January 2012, calamity struck. This cruise liner, the Costa Concordia, carrying 4,000 passengers and crew, hit a reef and then in agonising slow motion turned away and keeled over whilst trying to reach safety. 32 people died and the much criticised captain is standing trial. It's believed to be the biggest salvage project ever of a ship this size, with costs heading up to a billion dollars by the time the operation is complete. No one could have predicted how life on this little lone island would change so dramatically. Beh, noi ci siamo molto interrogati sul fatto che l'isola da poco conosciuta divenisse un'isola conosciuta in tutto il mondo, però abbiamo riflettuto su un aspetto, sul fatto che veniva accostata all'isola la parola tragedia. The number of people staying at least one night on the island fell by a quarter in the year after the disaster. The regular vacationers clearly deterred by the wreck. But out of disaster has come opportunity, and the wreck has now become a somewhat macabre tourist attraction in its own right. And over half a million people have come to see the stricken ship over the past three years. Before we rush to judgment too quickly about the day trippers that come over to see the wreck of the Costa Concordia, it's probably wise to remember that a whole mini industry was spawned from the disaster that was the Titanic, and that even today, people go to the World Trade Center in New York to pay their respects to the dead. When I first did see it, it was a bit eerie, just because, again, people did die on it, but as I said, I, I, I like seeing it and I like being here. It was very interesting and I wanted to see it and my dream came true because now we have an apartment and we can see that Costa Concordia view. It's tasteless, you know? In the, yeah, yeah, it's a little right. bit tasteless because only to have a look, somebody is dying or... But it's not just the tourists. There are also some 500 people hard at work salvaging the ship and they all bring in business to the island. 
Sergio's Pizzeria found itself with year-round bookings, thanks to both the salvage crews from 25 different countries and in their wake, hordes of visiting sightseers. He's been employing 12 staff full-time, instead of going down to a skeleton staff in the winter. In business, you have to say that it went very well. Considerato che c'è una bella crisi in Italia e non solo, te lo dico, nelle disgrazie c'è sempre qualcuno che, che ci guadagna. Dispiace per quei, per quei morti. But Giulio's mayor feels the benefits experienced by some working in tourism here are offset by the losses suffered by others. Quello che è avvenuto in questi ultimi due anni c'è stato un incremento delle attività economiche di 10-20 attività su Giglio Porto, perché direttamente interfacciate con le operazioni della rimozione. Tutte le altre che costituiscono il 70-75% dell'economia isolana hanno invece subito molte penalizzazioni. E sono convinto che quando la nave andrà via eh, ci sarà il risorgimento turistico dell'isola a vantaggio sempre del turismo tradizionale eh, che oggi viene solo per la parte di Giglio Porto, sostituito dagli operatori della Concordia. The ship is now due to be towed away in a few weeks. And in a final twist to this story, many locals feel it would be a huge mistake to remove the Costa Concordia in the middle of the peak season here. But nevertheless, Costa Concordia's shocking arrival in Giglio and extended presence will leave a permanent scar on the island. Never again will it be a secret getaway only known by a privileged few. Now it's time to check out what's been happening in the world of travel this week. We start in America where Yosemite National Park celebrated its 150th birthday this week by breaking ground on a new project to protect their ancient sequoia trees, which are among the oldest living organisms in the world. Yosemite is America's oldest protected park and welcomes almost 4 million visitors every year. Over to Antarctica where researchers this week warned the emperor penguins could be at risk of extinction as a result of melting sea ice. There are calls to classify the species as endangered which may put limitations on tourism to the region. Kazakhstan may be best known for the Sasha Baron Cohen film Borat but officials are hoping to change this by waiving visa restrictions for many tourists. From July 15th People from 10 countries will be able to see the country's 1 million square miles of mountains, forests and ski resorts, as well as the former home of novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, without the need for a visa. If you're in Paris this weekend, you could be forgiven for thinking you're seeing double. Standing 13 metres high in front of the original Eiffel Tower, this replica of the famous tower has been made from 324 chairs to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the monument. And finally, a reminder for holiday goers everywhere to check internet roaming charges on smartphones before going abroad. Although countries within the EU have set new caps on costs, consumer groups this week have warned that people still need to watch out for bill shocks and know what they're paying for. Now to something that might not find its way onto the itinerary of most tourists heading to London but nonetheless gives an insight into the social history of the city as we meet Rachel Erickson, the woman who takes people on guided tours on some of the capital's most interesting toilets. In here we have a genuine Thomas Crapper toilet from the late 1890s. Victorian toilets tended to have names, this one is the Venerable, made by Thomas Crapper. I will wash my hands now. We've got a marble counter with wash basins here. The Victorians, while they were quite prudish, took this wonderful civic pride in their bathrooms. I knew I wanted to be a tour guide because I loved London and I loved its history. 
And I had this very, very small obsession at the time with where you could go to the toilet for free. So that's kind of where it all began, was a strive to avoid paying 30p to use the loo. The question, what do I do for a living, is the one I both love and dread, because people ask it very innocently. And I tell them I do a tour of public toilets, and they go, sorry, you do what? London's absolutely full of hidden gems. This right here is a Victorian pissoir. There's not much in there. That's... Eddie. <laughs> Oh, it's just a wall. It's just a wall. It's not high tech. My information for the tour has kind of been collected over the years. It all started with Google, as most things do these days. So I typed in London toilets and found everybody has done a top 10 list. I started talking to people who run public toilets, quite a lot of academics. You can do a master's and a PhD in toilets. So I have quite a network of people. I get a really wide range of people on the tours. Uh, usually they don't quite know what to expect. I, ironically, I think it takes a really classy sort of person to come on a loo tour. Usually they are interested in the history and the politics of it. And the people who enjoy it least are probably the ones who came just to make the toilet puns, because they make them all in the first five minutes, and then they're going, what do we do now? Then we have the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, I saw this on, on the net and I thought, a loo guide, what could be better? I love toilets, I love London. I spend a lot of my time waiting outside a loo for my wife usually, so I thought I'd go and have a talk about them. I really love looking at toilets. I don't find it grim at all. I think there's this stigma attached to toilets that they're kind of disgusting, shady places, but actually I tend to seek out the really lovely ones and I think toilets can and should be very happy, cheerful, pleasant places to be in. Still to come on The Travel Show, I take up a new profession helping out at the Pope's official summer residence. I, I can try. This is a real honour to trim a plant in the Pope's garden. Welcome back to The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Hello, I'm Michelle Yana-Chan, your global guide with top tips on the world's best events in the coming month. From love mobiles in Zurich, to the Calgary Stampede, to busking on the streets of Italy. But first, in the UK, we speed up to Snowdonia, the mountainous region of North Wales, where Zip World Titan has just opened. It's an eight kilometre long, 70 mile per hour ride, where groups of four can take to the skies simultaneously. Don't close your eyes or you'll miss some sensational scenery, although it'll be a bit of a blur. The new ride joins Zip World Velocity, a pair of mile long zip lines 500 feet up and reaching speeds of over 100 miles per hour. Over to Italy, where the Buskers Festival kicks off in Ferrara on August 21st. 10 days of international street music and art. Nestled in Italy's Po Valley, the cobbles, pavements and sidewalks of this Renaissance town become a stage for hundreds of musicians from dozens of countries. West African drummers, Dixie bands, Celtic harpists, tango guitarists, 
plus the sounds of harmonicas, didgeridoos, even cowbells, it doesn't get much more eclectic than this. Yeah! <laughs> Across to Canada, where the Calgary Stampede begins on July 4th, a 10-day annual rodeo festival with parades, concerts and First Nations exhibitions. But the main events are the highly competitive rodeos, which culminate in Showdown Sunday. Visitors don cowboy hats and enjoy all the fun of the fair at an event that celebrates the area's Western heritage. To Hong Kong, where on July 12th, the Sheko Challenge will bring out keen athletes who can take the heat, facing combos of swimming, running and paddleboarding of varying distances. Now in its 10th year, the course will start at Big Wave Bay and head to Back Beach, where there'll be after-party beach sprints, volleyball and dancing. August 2nd, set your watches for 1pm, when Zurich, Switzerland will be hosting one of Europe's biggest street parades. There'll be 30 floats, or lovemobiles as they're called here, and 600 DJs with a million people in the streets. The Lovemobiles will be pumping out house and techno as they make their way along the two and a half kilometre route in and around the streets of Lake Zurich. En route are six stages with electronic music, live acts, multimedia and dance animations. The party continues till midnight or more. In the UK over the final weekend in July, the Sunderland International Air Show will take to the skies. Known as the biggest free annual air show in Europe, it's held near the Roca and Sieben seafronts and draws over a million spectators. This year, there'll be the Red Arrows, the Royal Air Force Aerobatics display team, as well as a Battle of Britain memorial flight and the Breitling team of wingwalkers. <laughs> In the USA, the pageant of the Masters in Laguna Beach, California, begins on July 9th and will run until the end of August. Playing every night, this is theatrical illusion, where real people pose to look like their counterparts in classical and contemporary artworks. That's my global guide this month. Let me know what's happening in the place where you live or where you love. We're on Facebook, Twitter and email. Until next time, happy traveling. Thanks, Michelle. Now to end this week, let's head back to Italy and the small town of Castel Gandolfo. Situated in the Alban Hills some 15 miles south of Rome, it served as the Pope's summer retreat since the 17th century. And this year, for the very first time, the breathtaking gardens surrounding the residence have been declared open to the public and I've been given exclusive behind the scenes access. More than 130 acres of sculptured gardens, manicured lawns, lakeside views and even a working farm. Not bad for a holiday home, and it's no wonder that Castel Gondolfo has been a favourite retreat for popes keen to escape Rome's stifling hot summers in years gone by. But, unlike those that have gone before him, Pope Francis, elected in 2013, chose to share this paradise with everyone in a new spirit of inclusion. This is a real historical moment. Um, why did the Pope decide to open the gardens up to the public? Questa è stata una scelta specifica di Papa Francesco che non venendo a Castello ha voluto però aprire i suoi giardini al pubblico. I, I get the impression that he's different from other popes. Ho incontrato Papa Francesco e l'incontro è stato un, un incontro come tutte le cose molto particolare e mi sono sentito a mio agio ma nello stesso tempo sapevo di essere la presenza di un grande pontefice. Although the new pope has been praised for his modern approach, the gardens are firmly based in traditions dating back to the 17th century. After nearly three months spent at his summer palace at Castel Gandolfo, His Holiness the Pope prepares to return to the Vatican. 
It was Pope Pius XI who had the property renovated in the 1930s, restoring the grounds to the style that we see today. But up until now, the intricate designs have largely been closed to all but the rich and famous. Like George Bush and his wife Laura, who are guests of Pope John Paul II in 2001. And history was made when Pope Francis flew to meet his predecessor, Benedict XVI, on these lawns last year, the first time such a meeting had been possible in 600 years. And this is the man who today is in charge of keeping the gardens trimmed to perfection. This looks like a really intricate job. How do you make this so round? How do you do it? Uh, in this modo. And it's perfect. Can I have a go? Di solito non facciamo tagliare a nessuno. Però possiamo fare un'eccezione soltanto in questo caso. So you're making an exception. I can, I, I can try. This is a real honour to trim a plant in the Pope's garden. Yeah? Like this? Okay. Maurizio has worked here at the gardens for 22 years. It was a boyhood dream. You know, when you were growing up, you said you always had a passion, you know, to, to work in gardening. Did you ever imagine that you'd end up being one of the Pope's gardeners? No, non l'avrei mai immaginato, è come quando si realizza un sogno. And on your first day working here, were you nervous? Were you worried that you were going to mess up when you were the, cutting the plants? Ero emozionato e avevo paura naturalmente di sbagliare, mi sono subito affidato al, nelle mani esperte dei più anziani. Inizialmente pensavo ad uno scherzo. Before I go, I asked Maurizio if I can put my green fingers to the test just one more time. Va bene? You trust me? Sì. What about this bit here? Ma lo lascerei. No? No. No, no Ci more. penso io. Oh, okay, you say. Okay. It. <laughs> I've been told. Well, I think I'm going to have to brush up on my gardening skills before I'm invited back to the Pope's summer residence. I'll leave it to the experts. Well, that's your lot from us for now. Time to find out what's going to happen on next week's show. Next week, Krista is at Taronga Zoo in Sydney investigating a new chapter in the fight against wildlife trafficking. The trade in endangered animals and products across the globe is experiencing an unprecedented surge, but now a new app could see tourists with mobile phones coming to the rescue. We thought, why not use the technology that's available these days, get smartphones and turn them into wildlife trade reporting tools for anyone and everyone. So join us for that if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget we are all over social media. Our website is definitely worth checking out. So details of where to find all of that are on your screens now. But from me, Adia Depitan, and all the Travel Show team here in Rome, it's Arrivederci. Thank you.